my hair or the dog for me. Cool. All right. Well, um, I guess it's kind of weird because I don't really need to give you an introduction, but I'm here with uh, Jack Blood, and if you don't mind, Jack, telling uh, the people a little about who you are and uh, what brought you here today. Today. Well, thanks, Frankie. I was invited by the president and the first lady of the Republic of Texas, uh, John and Sally. We've done a lot of events over the years with these guys, and they are really pretty much the salt of the earth. They, you look that up in a dictionary, and John and Sally's picture are there. Um, they don't have any shirts because they probably gave someone the shirt off their back. Oh, no, yeah, those people, like, I've only known them for a short bit, and they're the <laughs> sweetest people I've ever, yeah. ever met. It's cool because I, I sometimes do, uh, what is it, John owns a, a construction company, a remodeling company, right? So I work with him occasionally. And we have an arrangement where he pays me in reserve notes so I can take care of the uh, the uh, corporate part of living in the U.S. And then he pays me in silver. Nice. The rest of it. So it's pretty dope, man. Well, I love that. I don't love the electronic money. I don't love the bitcoins. I don't love the stuff the kids are doing these days. But I'm pretty much, you know, the old guy that says, get off my lawn with that electronic money. Because that's really what I think the end game is, is if we're all on electronic money, we, you know, maybe we pay for things with our cell phone or we've been trained to pay for things with cards and magnetic strips. And right. and all of that, of course, is data-based. And people will say, well, why should I care about that? You know, it's always the law-abiding citizens that get hurt. That suffer in the end, yeah. Yeah, the it's criminals, a- they don't care because they got it figured out and they got nothing to lose, well, you know. The, the criminals, they already decided <laughs> they weren't going to follow the law to begin with, right? Exactly. Yeah, so... Yeah, I love it. I think, you know, a couple of years back, Frankie, people were getting into using silver dimes to pay for things. And it's a low unit of money. Right. It was like about a tenth? Or an well, it would be about two. At the time, it's a couple of years ago, it was about two seventy. Two. Okay. That's what a dime is now worth, $2.70. What does that tell you? Something yeah. wrong has happened here. <laughs> and uh, more and more people were taking. Uh, more and more people were taking silver, and there's also barter currency. Uh, I know they're called the hours or mountain, mountain hours. hours. Yep. Right. Which is great. It's, uh, you know, it's difficult to sometimes for people to grasp the concept of, you know, it doesn't say Federal Reserve note on it. So good good for John, good for you. I think the more of us that do that, uh, the more acceptable it's going to be. The less of us that do it and the more of us that get into electronic money and cell phone money, the worse it's going to be for all of us. Well, see, I, you know, I, of course, it's cool that, you know, I always like having conversations because I, I do tend to disagree with people on things. And that's the best part of sure. a conversation, you know. See, I like the whole idea of the cryptocurrencies and all that because it's like, because to me, anything could be currency. Like we could trade beers right now if you wanted to. You know, to me that if it, to me it's a whole, I guess it's bartering. You know, it's just like trading needs for necessities. You know, versus uh, well, you have to have this one fixed stated thing to sure. do. You know, but it's very popular. I wish I was on the bandwagon, but it, it's not on. really cryptocurrency because anything you're doing online is going to be recorded, and there it's a faith based. Uh, monetary system, much right. in the same way a fiat currency would, would right be, now. because it, it, when it, what was uh, Bitcoin was worth something like twelve hundred dollars here, maybe six months ago. Right. What is it now, like six hundred dollars? Yeah, it's kind of flattened out. And if people lose faith in it altogether, you'll be holding worthless Bitcoins, right. you know. Right, and it took that hit when, uh, like, I think well, I forgot what nation. I think it was China or someone said they weren't going to let their people do it, and then some other, and then some other corporations. But that seems to like steadied out at the five to six hundred because all of a sudden, I think Dish Network was the first ones to be all. I'm, you know, I'm skeptical about the. Well, what does that tell you that if the corporations and, and, and politicians like it, it, you know, they're leading you somewhere, right? That's true, true. You know, but it's one of those things. The intent of it was as awesome to get yeah. away from the centralization of it. Um, well, today you spoke with us here at the Republic of Texas rally. You spoke and you know gave uh, a pretty good speech. Uh, you know, it was it's pretty a, good. Yeah, dude, I was not like, like great or anything. No, it wasn't pretty good. It wasn't great. It wasn't like <laughs> well, I'm not ready to go to to combat for you. Or Love you, like Frankie, that. man. <laughs> you, you're bold, brother. But That's at least, great. but at least you gave. Uh, some energy to this crowd because this crowd kind of was a little dying out and kind of give them a little joke which is cool because they need it but um so I'm wondering uh, because you seemed where you were talking you seemed like you really uh, you kind of believe in this idea and you kind of see what they're going or you like the direction they're going yeah what makes you so I guess confident in it 
because I still have one. Well, I don't know if, if, if we need to be confident in it or not. You know, all of this is an experiment. So it, this is the great thing about this country. If you let states experiment and they don't have to, quote unquote, secede or call you on your, your phony documents, that makes this the state of Texas. It's really, when you get into how Texas was annexed, not only was it annexed illegally, but it was annexed without malcontent. It was annexed with malcontent. So there was a lot of promises made. Those promises weren't kept. Um, do I believe that the Republic of Texas will succeed? I don't know because stranger things have happened. Let's face it. And you know, I think that if the hurt gets put on Texans enough, and there has been, you know, what is it? Uh, you know six seven eight years of some pretty good prosperity so people feel a little fat and happy here but when everybody else in the country comes here and they bring those kind of traditional say california ideals to texas right, and we're kind of seeing that now yeah. it is it, they're starting to flourish a little bit here and so far texas hasn't have to been in the battle we don't have the things going on we don't have as much of a boot on us like the eastern coast cities do and we're not being robbed completely blind like they are on the West Coast. We've been, you know, kind of stable. But now it is starting to come home and roost. And so... Well, sure. And, you know, you've got a massive human rights problem here on the border, which is, I think, you know, getting people's attention. You know, this isn't something that will happen tomorrow unless some seriously bad things happen. But I love the, I love the intent of it. I love the idea of it. And will it happen? Like I said in my speech, Frankie, you know, I'm sure a lot of people thought that we'd never win a fight against the British and that we would never get to be our own country. Uh, I'm sure people thought that we wouldn't, um, you know, have won the independence that, which made this a Republic of Texas to begin with, and it happened. And you know that, you know how that went, right? If I was the fly on the wall, hey, um, be part of our country or we're going to side with Mexico against you. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's the same thing they, they just did to Libya or the same thing in, in, you know, different times that they're doing to Syria right now. And that is to absolutely control everything because as John D. Rockefeller once said, competition is a sin. They don't enjoy it. And I love when John, President John Jarnarkey, was talking about how competition is important. And that is a big part of the Republic of Texas agenda is to let technology and ideas flourish without this attack constantly on getting rid of the competition. So the idea is great. The people that are involved and, and are, make up the core of the Republic of Texas are some of the best people in the world, in my humble opinion. And, you know, if you can uh, get the rest of Texas into it, good. There might be a lot of people that just want to leave. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. And well, I have, you know, I've only been involved with these people for about a, I've done some research into them, but I've only been deeply going to their meetings for about six months now or something like that, right? And the only thing, and I, I like I said, I'm pretty much on board with them. The only thing I seem to have problems with is they're kind of, a, for lack of a better term, Christian fundamentalist. And uh, I think a lot of the things they do are kind of knee-jerk reaction. Like, because I've gone to their actual meetings and sure. they, you know, where they propose bills and things to operate once we become a republic once again, right? And it's like they have a no fluoride bill, a no lobbyist bill. And I see these things as, well, you're just reacting to the torments that we lived under the uh, the current U.S. system. Because I consider myself under military occupation. Right. Because that's the way I see it is, you know, if I don't pay the U.S. government, it's not Texas. No, it's that's true. Gonna, yeah. that, it's not Texas that's going to come after me. It is the U.S. government that's going to come after me. And um, but we argue a lot with them because, uh, like you mentioned, the, the humanitarian crisis on the border right now. I I guess I sat along the lines of not I guess I'm pretty sure I sat along the lines of anarchy. You know I'm a big believer in no borders beyond private property. It's mm. like if I don't own it personally, if I didn't sure. exchange and, and I do, it's yeah not yeah a well, I get you, but that's that's utopia. So we don't live in utopia. In utopia, we wouldn't have borders. We would have one world government that where we all work together to make sure we can help each other, to make sure that, you know, one person isn't stealing something from everyone else. But since we don't live in utopia, we do live in reality, the more borders you have, the more decentralized the power structure becomes. So, though I love my country, I'm not a nationalist, right. but I know that at least the idea of a border and whether that's the Republic of Texas border or I live in Georgia, it's the Georgia border. 
it stops people from infringing their own personal ideals on me and my family when they live somewhere completely different than I do. So we can, you know, for instance, we don't have a lot of control over Atlanta, where I live, right. but we sure have a lot of control over East Atlanta, and they're afraid of us. So, and it's, you know, liberals, conservatives, um, all different kinds of people working together. I myself, I'm, a, I'm not a religious person so to speak but I am a spiritual person I believe in a higher power in the universe I just don't presume that I know what its name is I don't talk to it yeah Yeah, it doesn't talk to me so to speak other than I guess in just uh, vibrations and emotions so but I'm not put off by it because I've known uh, John and Sally for you know 10-12 years and they're very open-minded your listeners can't see us here but if you saw the crew i brought in people with tattoos on their faces and you know body to neck to ankle tattoos and punk rock clothing and everything and they they just couldn't be more accepting of of all my friends so i can see how open-minded they are which is i think um what a lot of people would say christian christian fundamentalist all of this they wouldn't be that open-minded and they certainly are and i i com- i commend them for it yeah like i said it was a it's a lack of a better as a lack of a better term it's my fault for not being more articulate and more literate i guess that's why i straightened you out frankly and there you go <laughs> but uh no when i when i talk about it what i mainly talk about is they have this because i was going to actually join the republic and be a sitting member i was going to be a, a, a chief justice but they wanted me to swear on a bible and I told them I have problems with that because that book doesn't mean anything to me and it means a lot to you. And so for me to swear on it would be kind of me poking at your faith. Yeah, you're, and a, I, you're a stickler. You're a I, purist. Right, and I don't want to insult you because that would violate the aggression. You, you know? did, though. I mean, you have to respect other people's traditions and values and you don't have to adopt them for your own. You know, a lot of people will say on the issue of the Republic of Texas that it's, it's you know, ceremonial. Yep. Um, this is the same thing that you hear when city council, for instance, when I was living in Providence, Rhode Island, we brought our entire radio station into the city council chambers, and we brought 500 people who said, not no, but hell no, don't vote for the Patriot Act, and they were going to vote it through. Right. It was a unanimous decision to, to repeal the Patriot Act in Providence, Rhode Island, city council in 2003. Okay, unanimous decision. So I go to the bank. Maybe a week later, and I see the forms. I'm in the back, and you know they're hooking me up with something. And I look, and I see a whole stack of forms from Homeland Security with the Patriot Act stamp on it, really? so that they can tell them what the where the money goes, and who sent it where, and who did what. Because in reality, that was a ceremonial decision that city council made on a on a federal issue. On municipal issues, city council is so powerful they control the police chief, the mayor. Yeah. Like, I mean, all of it. Oh, that's and you know the old days. adage: you can't fight city hall. Yeah. You can, and I've seen one guy raise his hand and stop parking meters going up on his street or something. So, if you don't do anything, they'll just rubber stamp it all through from the police state because that's where the federal grant money comes through right. to um, to every you know nanny state law that comes down so I'm with you I'm an anarchist but I'm also um, people will call me a minarchist because I, I've been on the streets I've seen how evil people can be how dangerous people are and you know I don't mind having police I respect friends that are police you know I have friends that are in the military so so I have to be realistic about it. In Utopia, maybe we'll get there, Frankie, sometime, and we'll live in this where we all, like, work together, and we have this, you know, we can run our own lives, and no government, and no cops, and no nothing. But um, until that time, I just think it's important that we do every little thing we can, inch by inch, if that's what it takes, to roll back and to repeal everything we can get our hands on. Right, and I mean, I totally, I, I understand that, and I totally agree with what you're saying, that it's it's a, it's a far dream to get to that point of no government, where the government exists, starts and stops with the individual. It, it is a long road, but that's why I got involved with the Republic of Texas, because to me, I consider them anarchist light. You know, because it is it's what it is. It's anarchy light because it's... it's Minarchist, sm- yeah. yeah. It's the smallest form of government you can get at the county level because I've read through their constitution and I've had plenty of times of sitting down and talking to them and that's what they seem to explore is the fact that, well, we want everything to be up to the county level so that if uh, Gillespie County, which is a county Fredericksburg's in, if we want to have uh, hookers and, be- and booze served 24-7 <laughs> we and you know, Kerrville doesn't want to have it, 
we can coexist. That's right. And know? they get to decide. You yeah. know, I mentioned the minimum wage in Seattle, okay? And a lot of people get very upset about it, and they get, you know, divided, and that's the whole divide and rule thing is pretty effective if we go along with it. And I knew it was going to end in disaster. It already is a disaster, and, you know, we can get into all the specifics of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but no one's ever done it. So, I mean, this is, as our founding fathers said, is a lively experiment. And I want states to experiment. I want cities to experiment. So let's see. I mean, I don't think a $15 an hour minimum wage is going to work. I think you just cut people's taxes and they're making twice as much. But... But at the end of the day, let's see. Let, let let people experiment and see how it works. We don't all have to be in this like lockstep cult as this one like country cut, cut. all thinking alike. Anyone yeah. that doesn't think the same way is the nail that sticks out of the board that gets hit first. You know. Right. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of that, and we we go through. I have my struggles here in Fredericksburg. One of the biggest battles is uh, I battle the cops constantly in this town because there is a a hero worship of cops and the military in this community. And that bothers me a lot because I have a real problem with sending poor people to go kill other poor people for the colors of Big your time. gang. Yeah. You know, that, sh- that shit bothers me, dude. Well, and listen, I mean, look, go ahead. Two, some of the poorest states we have in this country are what? The biggest oil states. Louisiana. Right. Well, why are they so poor? Why is West Virginia so poor when they're giving us all this coal? Cool. You know, yeah. and so when we're talking about the Republic of Texas, we're talking about the 15th. It was actually at one time, I think in 2008, it was the 13th largest economy in the world. Really? So it's even slipped a few notches. You know, everything that is needed is here in Texas. So, listen, the, this may be a, a town, uh, old school, that respect the police. They remember, you know, when you're... Your cop lived in the neighborhood, and his grandfather was a cop, and his dad was a cop, and he was a cop, and right. he walks the beat in the neighborhood he lives in, so he has to be accountable to the neighbors. But I'll tell you something about Texas I learned living here eight years, is you push Texans too far, and they're going to stand up, they're going to buck up, and they're going to push back. Right, you, you might get punched in the mouth. <laughs> You know, it, it does happen. But the reason I brought it up is my real problem with it, because I get that some people need that sense of security. They need, they feel comfortable, and I, I understand the, and the whole thing. Like you said, living on the streets. I, I spent a, a few years living in dumpsters and eating out of them, just because I couldn't. Conform. You gotta make that into a promo. You know, there it is. And uh, <laughs> so I get it. I've seen the horribles of it. But the thing is, uh, when you spend as a community, in this community, we spend. Uh, last this year's fiscal budget was 4.8 million dollars just to law enforcement and only the 300k to education and this yeah. bothers me because and then they just passed this last uh, uh election they just passed a bill to build a um, a 16.9 million dollar prison uh, you can see uh, I don't know if you came in on 290 from Austin yeah, when you came in here but yeah it's over there right to you you know it's this big freaking Taj Mahal dude and it's because they have a new courtroom a shooting range all this other stuff in it and it's not just, it holds 146 people is the maximum prison and I was like Y'all manage 30 people a month, and then most of the time, most people in this community spend max three months in jail confinement if they don't go off to TDC. or For know, nothing, so. usually. Right. Usually, it's a victimless crime, yep. you know, marijuana, Thank you. cooking yeah. meth, mm-hmm. you know, because I'm one of those people that I don't, because I've, I've discovered those people that are like, well, only pot should be legal. And I was like, nah, this dude wants to fucking slam Drano in his fucking veins. He should be allowed to. I well, look at the, the problems and the expense the drug war has caused. You know you know what you're getting at, Frankie? And this is something I didn't have time to talk about. I had a half hour today, so that's why my speech was only kind of okay. Because another, uh, well, another, another half hour and I would have gotten into... A good something called positive austerity you Uh know so we've seen what negative austerity is in greece for instance that it hurts the bottom of the pyramid and not the top of the pyramid so when we look at all the money that gets spent on the police state uh to put fluoride in in, in the water supply i know in dallas it's millions of dollars and that's why they're going to take it out because they don't want to spend the money on it anymore and and then look if you want fluoride you can go to walmart and you can buy fluoride off the shelf and you could guzzle it again it's, it's up to you you know um, so positive, positive austerity, it cuts budget slashes corporate welfare. I mean, it cuts at the top so that the money gets to the people at the bottom. Because I, I'm certainly not somebody that, that 
is against helping the poor. The thing is, if we're not paying taxes, if we're not being, you know, extorted to pay this protection money to people that won't even protect us. I mean, the ma- I used to live in Providence, man. The mafia, would you paid them the protection money, you don't have to lock your door. And no one would dare go in there. They're going to protect you. And as long as you keep paying that money, nothing bad will ever happen to you. Uh, the government, of course, says that, and they can't do it. So right. we start cutting from the military. We start cutting to, you know, it's, a lot of people don't even know this, Frankie. Um, $50 billion a month goes from the discount window at the Federal Reserve. The discount window means almost zero interest on that money, $50 billion a month, and then we get to pay the interest on the money that the ones and zeros in the computer that they can go now loan out 10 times with fractional reserve lending. You know, you start cutting all of that, there's going to be a ton of money left to build schools, to do things that are good for people, that will create and put this country back where it was that other nations around the world can look at and say, let's go there. Let's do right. it like that. Because of right now, we can't criticize China or Russia or anybody. We Who are we to talk? We're complete immoral hypocrites, you right. know? And um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting that I saw, you know, I'm a 90s kid. I was born in 84, right? So I grew up through the 90s. So I saw this kind of shift where it was an American exceptionalism, you know, and we were actually... Because you know, I, I believed in the old red and white and blue so much to the fact that I, I joined the military and I was getting ready to go to war, you know, for my country. But somewhere along the line, I started realizing that other nations didn't see me the way I saw us. <laughs> yeah, and, to put it lightly. And, and then I started looking at why, and then I was like, whoa, I don't even like us now. And that's what led me to this point where it's like, uh, my first instinct is to say, you know, uh, just get rid of government. Because, I mean, you even talked, like you talked about it in your speech when you're talking about helping poor people. You as the individual can help the right. poor individual a lot faster, a lot That's more right. effectively if you just do it. That's right. We don't pay the bureaucracy. If the, you, you let us keep the 60% you're taking from us, um, you know, capital gains is 15%. Now, let's remember that. Your wife was looking for you. Um, you know. Wall Street pays 15% tax if they're even in the tax bracket because the zero, you know, not 1%, but 0.1% don't pay any taxes is something I said. Taxes are is slavery. Debt is slavery. If we're able to keep that money and we have a surplus of money, not only can we take care of ourselves and, as George Bush said, put food on our family, <laughs> but... Um, you know, we can also go start charities and, and open up uh, food houses. You know that it's illegal in many cities and states to even feed the poor. Yeah. You know, I mean, what kind of freaking priorities do we have? So we need to take a very good, hard look at why some people are not doing good and other people are. And it has nothing to do with wealth distribution or it has nothing to do with so-called equality or giving people special privileges. It has everything to do with people being able to run their own neighborhoods and their own communities in the way that benefits the people from the bottom all the way up to the top. Right. Yeah. And... Well, that's you know that's how I like I said that's how uh, that's what we're hoping to do with FBG Live. You know, we're hoping to uh, give that that common man a voice and uh, introduce these new ideas yeah. of, of freedom and liberty. It's pretty fun. I just um, I, I just worry about certain things. It's like like how you were talking about. It's hard to you talked about corporate welfare, right? It's hard for people to understand that that the uh, of the majority of the problem is not the social program of welfare itself. It's the fact that it's corporate welfare. As, you know, like you like you pointed out in your speech, nobody here has a problem feeding the poor. The you know, but the thing is, though, we're not really feeding the poor. Yeah, we're but if you if you look at the strings for caviar, if you look at the strings that are attached to giving people any kind of public assistance, it's set up so they can't get out of it. Right. You know, and and they, that's why they resent it, and that's why they don't like it. You know, I've been there myself at a time. And um, I could tell you, 80% of the people think it's a real funny joke that they're scamming on free money. And they really do. You know, 20% of the people, that is especially, you know, single mothers with children and, you know, people that really get hit the hardest when the economy, you know, gets, gets funky. You know, they're the ones that have to be taken care of and helped and help to help themselves. So... Um, you know, I mean, because that's liberating is what it is. You know, what we have here, I mean, you know, get get on the welfare, get on the food stamps and all that. But you can't have another job. You can't make any money. You can't own a car. You well, can't, you know, I mean, yeah. if you have a house, you got to sell it. You know, I mean, it, it completely p- puts people in the wrong direction. And it's a very negative effect 
on on the people that could be the next you know genius that could invent the next you know uh, uh, make uh, sand into water I mean because anything is freaking possible or give us that ability you to could travel take, through time you could take carbon out of the ocean and create free energy Tesla you know it, it proved a hundred years ago that energy can be free for everyone you know we have to remember that John D. Rockefeller if he'd had his way we'd still be using kerosene yeah. he didn't want electricity because it was competition and it was only J.P. Morgan in a massive war that that had that fight and was able to, um, sorry, you know, put a leash and a strap and a, and a and a harness on that thing and keep us paying it. You know, I'm a big believer that if we're going to spend a lot of money on uh, energy, then let's go ahead and subsidize and then put in a place like Texas, you know, solar panels in every house and every business, right. you know, or bloom boxes on every business, which uh, accentuate. Um, energy to begin with and, and power it up like 10 times the normal amount but you can give people free energy you could do it so why don't they do it instead what they're doing I know in Atlanta is we're buying solar energy from from Oklahoma and people are having to pay for it I know here in Austin Texas a couple of years ago they're building a big solar plant so you can buy that energy now if I have solar and I'll just cut this here but if I have solar on my house and I'm I'm conservative with how I use my energy then in some places I can sell that back into the grid and I can not only not pay for that energy which but is a huge paid. bite out of my paycheck every month but I can get make a few bucks and then send energy out hey man and then we don't have to have armies going into the Middle <laughs> East and, I mean the whole thing just like works itself out and you think man I'm not even that smart and if I know this all the smartest people in the world should know it and yeah. and why aren't they it's like I interviewed Tim Russert from Meet the Press before he died and I said Tim I knew there weren't weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, how is it you didn't know with all your resources? <laughs> and he had no answer for that. Right. Well, I, I always like that joke that, uh, well, I knew there was weapons of mass destruction there because uh, they say bought and paid for by the U.S. I saw the receipt, as I think yeah. Bill Hicks would have said. Right, I saw the receipt. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I don't know, Jack. I'm trying to think of where else I want to go. We're good. I think we're good, man. Yeah, man. I appreciate you. The Jack on. Blood Show, uh, DeadlineLive.info, Radio Free Blood. If you put Jack Blood in the search engine, I come up first. We're on Monday through Friday on your station, I guess, and uh, a lot of little stations all around the country. We speak to about fifty thousand people a day. Yeah. Jack Blood, put it in your search engine and come see us. Heck yeah, man. All right, Frankie. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate you. You're the man. Thanks. Yeah, yeah man, that's fun. <laughs>